Welcome to Universo Kubernetes and the Connective Summary for Part 2, The Miracle of Life. We saw in Part 1 that cybernetics is a different way of making science that starts with a different way of looking at things. It is concerned with the why this and not something else. Traditional science could not look at events where circularity was involved. The idea of difference and using differences to change the input of a system generates circular causality through feedback information, which is crucial to understanding living vortices such as those occurring in nature. We are going deeper into cybernetics as we deal with chaos theory. This is not only interesting, but fascinating and powerful stuff. Part 2 the Miracle of Life Chapter 7 Living Vortices What is a vortex? How are they defined? Is a human being a vortex, literally speaking? The dictionary tells us that a vortex is synonymous with whirlpool, hurricane, tornado a distinct but separate entity from the flow that created it. It is a systemic product made from the materials that flow through it, has a fussy border separating the inside and the outside, is the product of a delicate balance between opposing forces, such as negative and positive feedback, for instance, order and disorder, cooperation and competition, stability and adaptation. Now let's add features 5, 6 and 7, which are needed to produce a living vortex, as identified by chaos theory. We add that it exists in the order of chaos, has a recursive structure built from the bottom up because it evolves from the simple to the very complex, and, and it is an open, self-organizing system with its own government and identity. If we really want to understand, we have no choice but to go in deeper into each one of the seven characteristics of vortices. This effort will take a little time. The rest of part two. Just so I don't lose you, I will label each of the seven characteristics of living vortices using big red numbers from one to seven for each characteristic. Number one, a separate entity. The vortex is an individual and separate entity but is inseparable from the river that created it. The stream is inseparable from other ecosystems to which it is connected. The abundance of animals and plants to which drink its water, the blades of grass, the ancient glaciers that altered its course, the climate and the seasons of the region, the generation of seasons given the orbit of the planet traveling through space, and so many other things. Life is a flow. This is the second characteristic. Human life is a living vortex, subject to a constant flux. Similar to the stream, each one of us as an individual is interconnected to the systems of nature, society, and thought that surround us and that flow through us. We live within moments that constantly affect each other and create an unpredictable chaos at many levels. And yet, within this chaos, all the physical and psychological order that we know is created. The stream and the human. The same as the stream, whose turbulent waters generate complex forms that renew themselves constantly, our physical bodies are being constantly renovated and transformed at the same time as our cells are being replaced regularly. Meanwhile, the I that we believe exists within our body, in our psychological center, is in a constant flux also. We are, at the same time, the same person we were 10 years ago, and substantially a new person. Given the principle of recursion, cells exhibit the same characteristics of the organism of which it is a part. Each cell of every plant and animal is a living vortex, given that it is built with the materials that flow through them. Each vortex has a definite shape but is really made of the material that flows through it. This graph shows the inputs and outputs of a human being. Information, air, water, food coming in, 
Thoughts, Action, Cellular Renewal and Waste Going Out As far as the flow of information goes, Norbert Wiener had this worse to say. Any organism stays together, given the possession of the means to acquire, use and retain information and information transmission, especially the society of masses which is too big to allow direct contact between its members. When we breathe, air flows, oxygen comes in, and carbon dioxide goes out. Water flowing through our body is regulated by an homeostatic balance. Incoming water displaces a similar amount about half an hour later. The flow eliminates waste. In a similar way, we humans are built from the materials that flow constantly through us. Our shape is created and maintained by the flow of which we are part. We are what we eat, what we breathe, and what we experiment from our environment. Sunlight converts into energy that flows through our body when we ingest food. Flows are present when we think, act, love, communicate. Metaphorically speaking, every human being is immersed in many rivers at the same time. Now it's time to briefly explain fuzzy borders, the third characteristic of vortices. In a vortex, a constantly flowing wall separates the interior from the exterior. However, the wall is at the same time the interior and the exterior. The same happens with cell membranes of animals and plants. For instance, our bodies do not have a clear border. The visible cells on our skin are already dead. Warren McCulloch used to ask his students, is the cane a part of the blind person? We know now that the cane is mapped by the blind man into his brain as part of himself, the same as a limb. Legal persons have fussy borders too. People often go to court to have a court determine the extension of their wealth. Not even countries have clearly defined borders. They are usually full of holes and gaps used by migrant workers to find jobs. The fourth characteristic of vortices is the delicate equilibrium between opposing forces and feedback information generating a spontaneous order. Each part of the river acts as a perturbing effect on each of the other parts. At the same time, the effects of these perturbations are constantly fed back from one part to the others. The result is turbulence, a chaotic motion in which different regions move at different speeds. Briggs and Pete continue saying, Systems such as the chaotic river that are dominated by positive feedback loops are turbulent and disorderly, but the moment that positive and negative circuits are engaged, they can create a new dynamical equilibrium, a bifurcation point in which chaotic activity is suddenly bifurcated towards order. Systems that self-organize from chaos only keep alive by staying open to the constant flows of materials and energy that go through them. Small fluctuations feed forward positively unto themselves in such a way that a small initial difference ends up amplifying and producing something totally unforeseen, in this case, the vortex. Organizations are structures that capture free available energy and construction materials which they then rearrange to produce more organization. Cells, tissues, organs, and living beings are the result of these trapped forces and materials. It is a fact of life that certain properties of matter allow it to organize in ways that energy and materials are channeled to bring about structures which are identical to the original. This is how life works. Energy can be amplified to command larger amounts of energy and generate more order. We are resorting to Ross Ashby's 1956 definition of amplification. If you provide a quantity, you produce another. Oranges produce more oranges. A living vortex is the result of opposing forces that produce homeostasis. Positive feedback couples with negative feedback to produce the miracle of human life. These systems complement and control each other 
through a process known as homeostasis, which is a system's capacity to maintain the same state. This is a picture of the homeostat machine invented by Ross Ashby and is able to keep its main variables in equilibrium fixed within certain margins. Homeostasis in organisms involves permanent physical work. This work keeps the flow of energy and materials steady. Matter is used to rebuild the complex molecules that are otherwise deteriorating and uses energy to pump order into them. Homeostasis fulfills the metabolic demand. For instance, the human body's temperature is a constant 36.7 degrees centigrade. Blood pressure is also kept within a certain range. Humans try to satisfy their material needs, buying and selling and exchanging among them, creating a structure called a market. Markets are an everyday life example of this dynamical equilibrium. Competition or the search for profits is positive feedback. Obeying fiscal, sanitation and banking laws is forced cooperation that guarantees control. The same phenomena of opposing forces is present at different organization levels. Mitchell Waldrop says, Atoms search for a minimum energy state, thereby creating chemical bonds between them and turning into emergent structures called molecules. Second example, organisms cooperate and compete in a coevolutionary dance, turning into a well-balanced ecosystem. Chapter 8. Lessons from Artificial Life the creation of the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico was sponsored in part by Citibank and other institutions during the mid-80s. A series of economic collapses in Latin America had shown the inadequacy of prior classical economic models, so a new approach to making science was born. Computers began simulating the way complex systems behave. The Santa Fe Institute studies complex adaptive systems such as financial markets, immunological systems, social systems, and other systems containing thousands of uh, autonomous agents interacting and learning and adapting to each other. Fashions and political expressions are example of autonomous agents doing what comes naturally and copying successful behaviors. Chris Langton has been a pioneer in investigating artificial life. Extremely fast workstation computers have allowed building artificial worlds that are described in full by a few simple survival rules. When these rules are followed using the recursion principle, very complex behavior patterns are generated. Life forms are born and die just as they did in the original game of life invented by John Horton Conway. Artificial life forms and adaptive agents slowly acquired more and more attributes. John Holland created the field known as genetic algorithms, that is, Artificial beings defined by software that are capable of exchanging solutions with other agents and can put evolution rules to the test in order to learn and adapt to this artificial environment. The science of complexity became a scientifically credited topic and added contributions from another Santa Fe Institute researcher, John L. Casti. Natural or artificial systems such as the stock market, the world of business, and highway networks can be described rigorously by mathematical systems and models. Stuart Kaufman has bridged the principles of self-organization and models of artificial life to the world of biology and to the beginning of life on Earth. He identifies genes and proteins as carrying out orders from their DNA and is researching for biological laws that would be applicable in any place in the universe. Brian Arthur has been one of the most important contributors to developing the idea of the new economy and the fact that it is shown capable of generating increasing marginal returns. For instance, every new server on the internet makes the whole of the internet more valuable and useful. Information does not wear out or get tired as it traverses the globe. In fact, it grows in usefulness. Arthur is one of the main proponents of the idea that the real economy is very far from the way economies have been seen in the past and realizing that collapses and failures exist. Chapter 9. 
Chaos Theory. In this chapter, we delve into the terrain of chaos theory. We have examined the previous four characteristics of living vortices, but we still have three to go. These are, they live at the border of chaos, the organization is recursive, the organization has an identity. Chaos theory is one of the many cybernetic theories, together with control theory, information, networks, and language, to cite a few. Chaos theory says that order is born from chaos. At times, things that look messy contain order. Briggs and Pete explain, the scientific word chaos refers to the interconnection existing beneath events that appear to be random. The often mentioned butterfly effect comes from the realm of chaos theory and goes like this. Given the proper initial conditions, the flapping of the wings of a butterfly in Peking can sometime later change the climate in New York. Spontaneous order appears in the border of thermodynamic chaos. What do scientists mean when they talk about the fact that life is born in the edge of chaos? Basically, that life is the product of a very delicate equilibrium. Life emerges in the border of thermodynamic chaos. On this slimmest of borders, there is energy that can turn into information and act to change something. If the area of fire describes the thermodynamic chaos, and the blue region is the absence of movement, life is generated in the very thin border between the blue and the fire regions. The edge of chaos is like a thin membrane, a region of special and complex behaviors that separates chaos from order. What lies on the other side of life in the opposite direction of chaos? The total order of inanimate objects. Waldrop explains, Complex systems have acquired the ability to place chaos and order in a balance. The border or the edge of chaos is where life has enough stability to sustain itself and enough creativity to deserve the title of life. The edge of chaos is constantly changing the field of battle between immobility and anarchy. It is the place where a complex system can be spontaneous, adaptive, and alive. Kaufman has stated, Collectively, molecules create a living cell, and presumably, the cell is in the edge of chaos because it is alive. A collection of cells can form an organism, and organisms collectively form ecosystems. Reasoning by analogy, it seems reasonable to think that each new level is alive in the same sense, by virtue of being in the edge or very close to chaos. This is an image of a synapse the small space where two neurons come together and sodium ions are exchanged. Life depends on what is really an information exchange. Life is based to a great extent on the ability to process information, store information, and map sensory information. Life makes a complex transformation on information to produce action. Mitchell's Waldrop book, Complexity, deals with the creation of the Santa Fe Institute. Speaking about the relation between the border of chaos and information, he says, at the border of chaos and order, we find systems which are sufficiently stable as to store information and sufficiently diffuse as to transmit it. On his part, Chris Langton has said, the border of chaos is where information sticks its foot in the door of the physical world and where it imposes itself over energy. The human brain is therefore a perfect example of something that provides that border where information, such as a simple instruction in the brain, translates into muscular control as it is shown here. How close are we to mental chaos? Two ounces of alcohol are enough to alter your senses. How far are we from static order? Three minutes without oxygen are enough to provoke brain death. How close is our body to chaos resulting from smoking tobacco? Here are some facts. 
The death rate is three times larger for people between 35 and 39 years of age. 50% of smokers beginning at youth will die because of tobacco. One out of six deaths in the USA are due to smoking and smokers provide 30% of cancer-induced death. How close are some organs from chaos? The effects of tobacco smoking on lung tissue are shown at the left. How close are we from mental chaos because of drug consumption? Here is a graph showing the loss of cerebral mass due to the use of methamphetamines. To sum up, every cell is a miracle of spontaneous order, ordered chaos. It is the expression of the materials that flow through a cell where small niches of previously ordered matter amplify their power and control over the matter that is flowing entrap what is necessary to rebuild themselves constantly. This process, or continuous flow, is the miracle of life. Bruce Lipton is a biologist researcher. Lately, he has been traveling the world delivering a surprising message. Each cell is an intelligent organism. If cells were removed from the body and placed in a petri dish, they will manage their own life, adapt to their environment, reproduce and form communities with other cells. A cell can function in the human body as part of a 60 trillion cell conglomerate or as a single entity. In the first instance, it will become subordinated to the higher authority that coordinates the organism and directs all the cells. The membrane or cell wall is the equivalent of the cell's brain, although it is really a mechanical brain which is controlled by the cell's environment. This is how the environment also plays a part in controlling your brain because it influences the positive and negative signals that hormonal glands send to your brain. Under stress, cells shut down and stop growing. The same is true for your whole body. Unfortunately, every person is conditioned to choose the things that produce stress. More surprisingly still, is the fact that human perceptions become the voice of command that rules the cells. In other words, the images of the world that we carry in our head control our life and the health of our body and that of each individual cell as well. Cancer, you produce the cancer whether you choose to or not. If there is a body and a spirit connection, this is it. A healthy mind generates a healthy body. Chaos theory applies also to the world of business. A grave mistake or unbalance in the price of a commodity can mean the loss of market share and bring chaos to the corporation. Chapter 10. The Miracle of Life The fragile border where human life manifests itself is not only one. It presupposes the miraculous combination of many circumstances that go from the very large to the very small, such as the size of the sun and the size of the chain of a DNA molecule. Steven Weinberg has calculated the following. If the initial energy of the Big Bang had been just one part in one followed by 120 zeros, life would not exist anywhere in the universe. At least in theory, there can exist other universes with other laws of physics. The current universe is the result of having won not one but many lotteries at the same time. We won with the levels of electromagnetic force, of the strong nuclear force that allows the existence of hydrogen and shining stars. The weak nuclear force is also just right. Gravity's magnitude attracts stars to galaxies. The mass and initial energy of the Big Bang, its temperature, and the rate of expansion of the universe are variables that seem to be adjusted with incredible precision to produce life. Amazing coincidences continue to appear as we look at our solar system. Our star, the Sun, has the precise size to burn its hydrogen supply and produce energy at a rate that has given us the necessary time and the ideal conditions for life to appear. 
Earth's orbit through space, 150 million kilometers from the Sun, varies by only 3% from being a perfect circle. If this orbit were as elliptic as Mars, we would alternate between being cooked and frozen, depending on whether we were closer or farther from the Sun. This fact is more surprising still when we realize that among the planets that circle the Sun, the Earth's presence does not seem to fit correctly. Usually, the distribution of matter approximating a central attractor in a spiral can reach equilibrium following an exponential curve. Every successive turn is farther away by a constant factor. As is the case, each planet is approximately twice as far as the previous one, all of them except Earth, as this chart indicates. It seems the Earth does not belong in the solar system. The Moon is another of our celestial allies. Thanks to the presence of the Moon, no chaos has been generated in the angle of Earth's rotating axis, allowing life to evolve in circumstances of climatic stability during billions of years. This stability has allowed a more or less constant global temperature. We get that same kind of protection from Jupiter, the hydrogen giant, because its enormous mass attracts dangerous asteroids and comets. The impact of Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter gave us live pictures of what an impact on Earth might look like. John Gribben shows our close connection to celestial objects. All the internal planets of our solar system and our moon show in their stricken faces the scars of many of those asteroid impacts and there is a generalized belief that one of those impacts on Earth approximately 65 million years ago brought about the end of the dinosaur era and opened the way for the emergence of mammals, including ourselves. This implies that we owe our existence directly to the effects of chaos operating on the asteroid belts and brings with it the scary corollary that the end of civilization might arrive in exactly the same manner. Earth's magnetic field serves as a shield against radiations arriving to Earth from space. Otherwise, these radiations would make life on Earth impossible. The ozone layer is our first line of defense against the harmful effects of the sun's rays. It lies just beneath the stratosphere. Life on Earth is based on carbon, the only element that can form the long and complex chains necessary for the process of life. It is fundamental in the creation of proteins, fats, carbohydrates, enzymes, and nucleic acids. Carbon is the fourth most abundant element in nature. It is a solid at a temperature where water is liquid, another condition necessary for life. Carbon is the third element after hydrogen and helium obtained in the solar furnaces. It is also a prerequisite element for the creation of the rest of the elements. Another miracle resulting from the distance between the Earth and the Sun is the existence of water in its three forms, liquid, vapor, and ice. The list of ways water contributes to life is just too long to write down. Our luck continues to show up when life-generating proteins are created. If you consider that the number of combinations that 300 amino acids can produce you conclude that it would take longer than the age of the universe to find the right combinations. This pushes us to believe that something really improbable happened to create life. Chapter 11 Strange Attractors We have seen that life is a vortex phenomena and the continuous creation of order. Order is created at the border between thermodynamic chaos and immobility. The border of thermodynamic chaos is the only place to find energy that is available to be controlled by an attractor system. Chaos theory also takes us to the realm of strange attractors. Attractors are mathematically defined as points 
lines or regions in an XY coordinate axis that describe a pattern that outlines the points of stability of a dynamical system. A marble in a sink will settle down at the lowest point. The marble sink system is an example of an attractor. Briggs and Pete explain what scientists refer to when they say that a system has an attractor is that if you make a graph of the changes in the system or its behavior inside some mathematical space, the graph will show that the system is a pattern that repeats itself. The system, say the scientists, is attracted to that behavior pattern. In other words, if the system is perturbed and drawn outside of its behavior, it tends to go back rather quickly. The activity of a chaotic collective system is made of interacting feedback among its many scales of parts and called by its poetic name a strange attractor. Every living being is a strange attractor, a sort of magnet that attracts and captures what it needs to stay alive. Attractors are also related to the recursion principle. In fact, chaos theory comes from a part of mathematics that was called recursive functions. Briggs and Pete say, one of the vital principles of strange attractors and collective chaos involves the great diversity of all of these systems within systems. A healthy ecology contains a wide range and variety of species interacting with each other. If we reduce that variety and make the system more homogeneous, it becomes fragile and it will possibly collapse in a nonlinear manner. Two practical examples of the vulnerability of ecological systems come to mind. In sections of Yellowstone Park and Zion Canyon, the loss of just one of its members changed everything. William Ripple and Eric Larson have found that the eradication of wolves in Yellowstone and mountain lions in Zion Canyon completely alter the equilibrium among other species, mainly elk and other mammals. In both cases, there was a domino or cascade effect. Take Yellowstone. The number of Alamos decreased at an alarming rate. The rivers lost its beavers and the varieties of fish and birds afterwards. Amazingly, the forest turned into grassland. At Zion Canyon, the absence of mountain lions impacted the species living in streams, such as toads and frogs, lizard and butterfly numbers also suffered. In both places, the higher predator is the great balance creator of the lower species, a great lesson that we must learn and transfer to the world of politics and business, to say the least. An organism is a great attractor. Briggs and Pete say, overall, a healthy organism, whether animal or plant, has a strange attractor and is a strange attractor, jiggling, moving, shifting, filled with positive feedback loops that push the system into new directions and negative feedback loops that keep processes from flying off into merely random oblivion. I can't find a better example of the organism attractor than the activity of the big cats. Their margins of energy are truly very slim and they must preserve it to the max. Hunger pushes them to hunt, a violent activity. They eat and turn to sleep for about 20 hours a day, saving energy for things that are important, such as hunting, protection, reproduction. The sprint of the cheetah chasing its prey is an attractor in action in front of our own eyes. Watch the acceleration and then come corrections time and time again in a process that repeats itself until the target is reached. Positive feedback and negative feedback are combined to obtain the perfect result. Usually, the trajectory of a car on the road describes an attractor. Regardless of the conditions, it will stay within certain limits. Now an example when this does not happen. Full of positive feedback circuits that push the system towards new directions and negative feedback circuits that prevent the system from flying outwards in all directions. Certainly not in this case.
Stuart Kaufman says, a cell orbiting an attractor will express certain genes and proteins, making it behave as a certain type of cell. The same cell orbiting a different attractor will express other genes and proteins. Thus, our framework hypothesis states that cell types are attractors in the repertoire of the genomic network. Now look at attractors at the cell level. The practical consequence of cell attractors is explained by Kaufman in the following terms. The number of types of cells in organisms increases from 1 or 2 in bacteria, 3 in yeast, to maybe 13 or 15 in a simple organism such as the hydra, or maybe 60 or more in the fruit fly, and 256 in you and me. Ross Ashby defined the complexity of a system as its variety, meaning the number of possible states of the system. This concept is applicable to genetic malleability because it generates possibilities or different states of the system, called the cell. Each potential state of genetic variety produces a different cell type. Let's not forget the key cybernetic approach by asking, Considering all the existing possibilities, why did this happen and not something else? Attractors have the answer. What the attractor does is define one expression of that variety within the range of possibilities. Let's read what Stuart Kaufman has said in this respect. If a cell is a cycle state attractor, then we should be able to predict the number of types of cells as a function of the genes in the organism as the square root of the number of genes. A human being with 100,000 genes should have 317 types of cells. In fact, the number of known cells is 256. While attractors are present at the cell level, they can be found at the organ level too. Here are two examples, the heart and the brain. Briggs and Pete say, for heart muscle, the attractor is a sequence of neurons firing. The heartbeat has a strange attractor. It is not as regular as we assume. The brain attractor is stranger still, requiring a high level of neuronal chaos to provide the ground from which the sudden self-organization of thought and perception may emerge. Our brain self-organizes itself with every act of perception by changing its connections in a subtle manner. We now take a big leap to describe a business corporation as a strange attractor. Again, Briggs and Pete explain, chaos reveals that real-life corporations are as much strange attractors as they are hierarchies. They are nonlinear systems inextricably bound to the environment that gave them life and subject to the fluctuations of that environment and the personal that flows through them as much as they are power centers. Again, Briggs and Pete explain. Chaos theory tells us that systems tend to self-organize, preserving their internal equilibrium as they retain a measure of openness to the outside world. Chapter 12, Recursions. Recursiveness is nature's strategy to generate complexity. A few simple rules applied repeatedly during long periods of time can generate the richness of the known universe. This is the reason why the parts resemble the whole and the whole resembles its parts. Father Alfred Nolan explains, The universe is not a collection of objects. It is a system of systems within systems. This not only applies to the living organisms, Every natural object is a system and part of a system, a whole and part of a bigger whole. Take the cell, for example. A single cell, Thomas argued, is a fractal microcosm of what life has accomplished on Earth. At the tissue level, which are assemblies of cells, the same emergent order appears. Organs are the expression of this same phenomena at the next level of complexity, from the array of organs and tissues balanced by opposing forces a human being takes shape. As a matter of fact, K 
Chaos is linked to the concept of recursiveness. Briggs and Pete say, chaotic self-similitude resonates from the planet level to the individual cells of our body. Each one of us is a set of dynamic relationships between entities that we cannot say belong to us. Mitochondria, for example, cooperates with the cell but has its own DNA. The book Bionomics, written by Michael Rothschild in the year 1990, shows in great detail the structural similarities between a cell and a factory. Using the typically cybernetic input and output model, the structural similarities are impressive. You have a process, itself made up of other processes, which are coordinated and directed in the fashion described by Stafford Sabir viable system model, as we shall see later on. Materials are ingested, transformed into products, and labeled to facilitate their later use. The sharing of the same model for the cell in the factory is further proof of the recursive nature of organisms and organizations. The language of cybernetics is slowly being adopted into everyday use, which is something that will allow us to enter Plato's cave and explain the shadows to those inside. The magazine Astronomy, in its August 2007 edition, says that all living beings on Earth are made of cells, highly organized in different levels and with different activities, take energy and materials from their surroundings and excrete waste. They show homeostasis, internal stable conditions that are needed to stay alive, grow and change, showing mutation and differentiation, and reproduce by passing generic material to their offspring. Anything that shows these characteristics can be considered a living being. Self-organizing systems made of individuals such as termites contain several complexity levels. Each level has evolved its own rules. The termites' individual behavior and that of pairs follow a set of rules, and the collective follows another set. Something important worth noticing is that when a group comes together, it is not because one individual's leadership or an elite taking charge. The organization emerges from the coupling of feedback between random individual activities. What this means for practical purposes for businesses and government is that authority is limited by the behavior rules of the autonomous agents generated in different levels of the informal organization. The coupling of the parts and emergent rules will tend to displace or reshape the orders received. Chapter 13. The Viable System Model Every viable system contains and is contained in another viable system. The best example of a viable system is a human being. Cells, tissues, organs, body are viable systems contained in other viable systems. The human nervous system is the most complex creation in the universe and a marvel of control engineering. Stafford Beer identified six functions of control that are present at every level of recursion and are necessary and sufficient to assure viability. These functions are an operation, coordination, direction, audit, planning, and identity. Stafford Beer puts all these ideas together in the viable system model. He makes use of both the idea of recursiveness and of fuzzy borders. Beer's model has three main elements, these being a system that houses a metasystem or management and are contained in their relevant environment represented in the model by an amoeba-shaped area with a fuzzy border as shown here. Here are three examples of viable systems. A horse, a car factory, and a medieval castle. Viable systems are dynamic and complex and change constantly. Beer's model is a cybernetic solution to the notorious failure of authoritarian and centralized organizations such as the Soviet Union proved to be, as well as other governments and large private enterprises. The organization chart shown here is replaced by the cybernetic concepts of self-organization that are seen at work in nature. 
Beer's viable system model integrates many cybernetic concepts at the same time. We are going to build this model right here in plain view and in living color. First, we separate the three elements. The environment is colored green, the operation is red, and management is a blue box. Then we add a lower recursion level beginning with three environments and the operations used in production. We add the management of each using smaller red colored boxes. Now we show the communications and control channels existing between the environments and the systems. The description of system 1 is complete. It looks like a red colored pill. The next step is to couple system 2 called coordination on the right using the color yellow to set the operations. System 3 is the operations director with its vertical command channel shown here. To the left we show the audit function channel in red and white. Planning is labeled System 4 and is in charge of exploring the environment. System 5 is called Identity and monitors and ensures the balance between the activities of System 3 and System 4. Please note that we show management and coordination and audit for two different recursion levels at the same time. According to Beer, six systems or functions are necessary and sufficient to acquire viability because they allow living organisms to control the flow of materials, energy, and information that is coming from the environment. Only two recursion levels are needed to make maps and navigate recursively upwards and downwards within any viable system regardless of size until we are down to the smallest of operations or the simplest of processes. Every line or communication channel shown in the graphic expression of the model represents an homostatic circuit that is subject to Ashby's law of requisite variety which applies to all control systems. The discovery of recursive connections between living organisms was a crucial component of James Lovelock Gaia hypothesis according to which the Earth is a living cell. Briggs and Pete say, Chaos theory, just the same as the incredible image of our planet in space, furnishes a perception and a conception associated with it of an interconnected world, an organic, seamless world, fluid, holistic. George E. Hutchinson attended the Macy Foundation meetings. At the time, he was one of the first ecologists. Unfortunately, in spite of more than 60 years of awareness, the attack on the global cell on behalf of humans continues to grow. Briggs and Pete say, the earth that humans have redefined in the last several hundred years, an earth where human activity has destroyed the protective ozone layer, ambitiously destroyed tropical forests, and has genocidically finished with thousands of species, is the antithesis of the fluid and whole cell that are representatives the astronauts contemplated from space. The consequences of the attack on the global cell are slowly breaking into the collective consciousness in part because of the destruction of New Orleans by Hurricane Katrina, the success of that video and the risks incurred because of global warming cannot be ignored. Complex systems are not a theory, but a shocking reality. Chapter 14 Identity It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. Bruce? Finally, we arrive to the seventh characteristic of living vortices, an identity commanding its own will. Men and women are expression of the flows of materials passing through their bodies, these being a conglomerate of instances where chaos or forces that tend to disorder are being harnessed by information. Previously informed structures are controlling available energy in order to reproduce the island of order. The identity takes control of this selection process. The identity is linked both ways to a system's activity mix. Systems act in ways to preserve their identity, and the identity is the result of all these activities. Let's consider an example. 
Who are we talking about if we describe him by saying, He wears a hat and a mask. He rides on a horse named Silver. He works for justice. He rides away. Every human being has many dimensions of order according to his multiple activities or desires. Player, athlete, model, businessman, husband, father. For each dimension, an attractor traps the relevant flow, each one as a small hurricane stacked one on top of the other, one for each activity or desire. This last one traps lollipops. When someone seeks to incorporate a business concern, they must list a formal set of activities. These activities identify the corporation and translate into an organization and the process that materializes it. I talk about this more in detail in the Universal Manager video. A successful person is one which is capable of capturing the potential of all the attractors he encompasses and generates a vortex which is capable of attracting other people. An enterprise's success relies on its being able to integrate all its products and technology and getting maximum synergy and all the operational efficiency possible. Changing the world implies changing the paradigm and starting new flows in several areas. Personal change and self-improvement, strengthening of family relationships, acting ethically in business, creating a sense of community and solidarity, developing the country and its institutions, coexisting peacefully with other countries.